got a microphone, we'll share. Um, just introduce yourselves, tell a little bit about your background and perhaps why you think today. <laughs> well, good morning. My name is Tim Geary. I'm with London West Financial Partners and Senior Solutions Consulting. Uh, moved here from Los Angeles five years ago. A lot of people wonder why would you do that? And I always say, have you ever lived in Los Angeles? <laughs> you would now know why we are very happy here. Um, I think I was invited. I am a retirement income specialist who also specializes in long-term care planning, which is really part of uh, a good plan's income plan. Uh, I also uh, am married and have two beautiful daughters, and I'm just very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Bridget Wetterer, and I am from Home Services Unlimited. You should have pamphlets. We're a skilled home care for physical therapy, occupational therapy, we come to your home and it is covered 100% by insurance. We also have a company, um, primary care at home. So if you have a friend or a senior that can't leave the home that needs to have a, a visiting physician, we have Dr. Harine and he's actually the physician that does come to the home, not a nurse practitioner. Um, and I uh, was just asked to be here. I've been in this business about 12 years and I took care of my mom, and that's how I decided I wanted to be in the business. Thanks. That's a lovely voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a very nervous speaker, but I'm Jill Gilmer. I'm with Bright Star Care. Um, I think I've been in this 14 years, 13 years. <laughs> um, a long we, time. Um, it's a very long time. Um, so we do private duty of private pay, uh, long-term care insurance, and um, VA and med waiver. <coughs> we take a lot of different ones. We're just not skilled um, as she was describing with the PT and OT, but most of ours is companion care, um, help with bathing, dressing, um, just hourly <coughs> services with a caregiver. I have a question for both of you. So I'm just playing devil's advocate. What does it mean we're not skilled or we are skilled? Skilled care is um, nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech in the home. So um, you have to have a doctor's order, um, and we have to have a lot of other paperwork that you don't need to worry about, but we get it from your physician. Um, so you have to have an order for our services. And then our supplement her. So if you did um, have therapy in the home, but you still needed some assistance every day, um, even with meal prep. I know um, vacuuming, laundry, things like that can get more difficult. Um, so we are able to supplement those services. And like I said, it's generally paid out of pocket or with long-term care insurance policy, um, sometimes med waiver or VA. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah, that's good. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Cheryl Charliet. I'm a Surfer financial planner and the owner of a company called Sherpa Financial Group. Um, uh, my job is to help transition people into retirement, uh, investment-wise, and just all the aspects of financial planning. Um, I've been in business for 24 years. I was a mechanical engineer before that, for 14 years. Um, don't let the accent throw you off. I'm originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico, but I've been here for 40 years. So my kids will say I'm a Hoosier now. So, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, so cause I get that question a lot. Where, where are you from? Oh. I'm on board because I never lost my accent. But anyways, um, so yeah, so I'm a financial advisor. Um, I'm independent. I, I own my own firm. And um, like I said, we help people um, alleviate the concerns with, with, regarding retirement, not only transitioning to retirement, but through the years of retirement. And I'm happy to be here. That's awesome. Thank you guys all for being here. Um, we couldn't do these panels without our sponsors, but we also couldn't do them without our panelists because Sarah and I do not know all the things about all the topics that we, <laughs> we talk. We know a lot of people uh, that know those things. And so they're always gracious enough to, to be here and speak um, and uh, educate us and our audience. So, uh, okay, so we'll dive in and this is really informal. If you have questions, again, just raise your hand, shout it out. If you're there on Zoom with us, uh, you can type it in the chat box, uh, raise your hand. If you're on the phone, I don't see anybody on the phone, but it is star six on your phone to raise your hand on Zoom. And we'll dive in. What is the most common question you're asked by your clients needing senior services? 
Uh, for me, I would say uh, there's really two questions you usually ask. It's one, will I have enough to get me through retirement? Uh, especially in the inflation or things are going up uh, on an ongoing basis. People are afraid of, okay, do I have enough? Uh, how do I manage my money to make sure I it lasts through, through my life? And the second question I usually get um, is, how do I make sure my kids are well informed? Um, I know what to do if something happens when I'm incapacitated or I cannot communicate or whatever it is. Uh, how can I get organized about that? So those are typically my two questions that I generally get. Yours are more complicated. <laughs> Mine is how much does it cost? Like that's pretty much what it is every time. Um, but our hourly services are anywhere from 24 an hour to 30 an hour, depending on how many hours you can use. Um, so you can have A and P in care, um, where it's two hours in the morning, two hours at night, or if you need 24 7 care for a week because you had hip surgery, you could have 24 7 and then change your schedule later. So, number one is just how much does it cost? Um, not, I guess the, one of the ones, uh, uh, the same of how much does it cost and will my insurance cover it? Um, yeah. Because a lot of people, they say home care and they think of me and they think of Jill. So we have to ask probing questions. Is it physical therapy? Is it nursing? Or is it a home health aid? And then we can move um, accordingly. But again, most of it's how much does it cost and will my insurance cover it? And by the way, Bridget and Jill, um, they're not competitors. They work really well together. There's lots of home care and home health um, companies, and you all work and refer and do all the along. things. There's yeah. enough business for they're everyone, friends. unfortunately. Yeah. All right. I think the question uh, I get asked, I agree with Fido, um, the things that he said, will I have enough money? What happens if I get sick along the way? How do I protect? what I've spent a lifetime building. So that's what I'm asked. Good. Anybody have any questions online or in person? Okay. Uh, next question. How do people afford senior housing and or senior services? And Dave, this is maybe where I might call on you. So just don't be shy. Look alive, look alive. <laughs> All right. All right. So I, I think it goes to financial planning, how you afford things like housing, senior services as we age, as we need more care, it's putting together a plan as early as possible, thinking I'm going to need that. I work with younger people, I work with older people. The younger people, when we were younger, we weren't thinking about aging. <laughs> and then bam, here we are. So then we go, well, to me, it's all about education. That's why you're here today. What can I find out? Educate me, and then you'll make good decisions about what to do. Isn't it funny how that happens? You just one day you're 10, and one day you're going to say you're 45. <laughs> I wish I were 45. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes to home care, what was the question again? <laughs> Oh, how do people afford senior housing? Um, a little background is I was in the corporate world. I probably sold you a cell phone at one time because I did it for 20 years. Um, and then my dad died and my mom moved in. So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know about patient rights. I didn't know that you had a choice that you could decide who your home care was or you could decide who your, what facility you're going to go to rehab. I didn't know about any of that. So when I decided to get in this field, after my mom passed, I got my master's in geriatrics and then went to become a resource. So that people will ask me all the time, how do we afford housing? Well, then I sent them to a financial planner or to Sequoia or whatever. So the thing I think to, for you all to know is that a lot of people are resources and we know a lot, just enough to be dangerous about other areas. But it's always good to ask us because then we can send you to the right people that we trust. That's what's so great about this um, event when I started it. I don't even know if it was six or seven years ago, I've lost track, but 
Um, it gives all of us an opportunity to an opportunity to see one another on a regular basis. And we all, there's a million networking events we could go to probably every weekday, morning, noon, and night. Um, but I, I feel like this is this is hearty um, uh, material and and just a really good way to to get to know each other as well as you um, who are, are attending. So. Um, it's a really good resource and we all work together trading um, information and also clients um, uh, because we, we have a heart to, to help um, to help help seniors so yeah. Um, so I'm not an expert in this, so I would love to. Um, yes, you are. <laughs> um, but affordable housing, so a lot of times it does take a process, it takes time, um, and you are working with your estate planner or whoever it is, an elder law attorney, somebody like that. So um, we can provide care until you find a place or until you move. Um, and that's what they do with downsizing when they're moving. Um, so sometimes we're there in the interim as well. Um, but that's really. The affordable housing part is not my shameless um, plug. We did not pay Jill to mention downsizing. <laughs> <laughs> she just really loves Sarah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, one of the things I like or I love about uh, this job is that not two cases are alike. Um, yeah. Each person is uh, different. Every family has different circumstances. I love that about financial planning in general. Uh, is that when we sit in front of a couple or a family, uh, you have to get down to what is the individual circumstances. Uh, do they have family support? Uh, uh, are they all alone? How much money they have? How much planning has been done? As far as ahead of time with long-term care insurance or anything that else that they need, so uh, to me it's on a on a case by case basis. Uh, how they can afford it is is what I like is the troubleshooting, the problem solving, or figuring out how the pieces still fit together. So I guess there's no one answer, but just yeah, in general, it's just it's that yeah, thing. it really does, and I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, no two uh, cases or client or project is the same. And for those of us who get bored really easy, it's really fun because, and if, if who like problem solving, because we, you can ask Sarah this week, we solve problems <laughs> regularly. Sarah's been researching well and water treatment systems, and she probably never thought that's what she was getting into when she renewed her life, her real estate license and started helping seniors on, from a different perspective. <laughs> so yeah. And, and a lot of times when we talk about pricing and um, things like that, it's I always try to say it's not to be elusive when we say it really depends because every situation is different and um, we just we have the whole construction thing going on here. Yeah, we, we don't know what all they're doing, but there's a lot of trucks here all the time lately. Um, but yeah, so we really have to sit down and provide that free consultation to get a scope of the actual project or you know um, uh, how we can help uh, the client best, all of us, right? Any questions? I'll check again. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, Okay, I'm going to repeat the audience questions for those of you online. So ask it, and then I'll repeat it, and then you're on, Jill. Oh, that's a great question. What type of employees do you have, and how do you screen the employees? Good question. Um, but we hire home health aides and CNAs, both. Um, in the state of Indiana, we make them all a home health aide, so they have to be able to qualify. There are some PSAs that are not um, licensed agencies and they can hire just companions only. Um, but we are a licensed PSA agency. So it's CNA, home health aides. And on the screening part, we do background checks, drug screens. Um, they have to have CPR, they have, they have to have a TV test every year, and they have to do in services every year. So training every year, every month. And there are lots of home health uh, agencies in the in the area, in the central Indiana area. And I can tell you that Bright Star Care has been around. They have roots. They, they have a great reputation. And I know that's probably a hard space. The people that are doing the jobs actually in the house are like the lowest paid. And they're doing the grossest work sometimes. It's really kind of a tough, tough area. So yeah, who goes to you? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Do you ever have Israeli 
That's a great question. Too. He's, the question was, do you have personality conflicts between the client and uh, the, the caregivers? Yes, and I would say probably every company does for sure. Um, what I'm supposed to say is we guarantee compatibility, right? <laughs> but what that means is that if you do have a caregiver that is not um, a perfect fit for you, you know, say they just don't cook a certain way that you like, um, you just the food's not edible, or they don't really do a great job of cleaning, and that's mainly what they're there for is to help you with housekeeping because you can't do it anymore. Um, or even just bathing. If you want a male caregiver to bathe you, or if you want a female caregiver to bathe you, what you're comfortable with is what we try to strive for. So um, it's really about communication. The more you communicate, just like with financial and all of that stuff, when it comes to care, you have to speak, you know, what you need. You have to communicate that it's not a good fit. And then we can switch them out. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Any follow-up questions from that? Um, are we good online? I are you, are you oh on Zoom? Okay, yeah, on Facebook, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna once we once I once I confirm we're solid online, I'll let you guys know so you guys can share the video and everything. Um, but yeah. Um all right, so we talked about how do people afford, right? Uh, should I plan? Okay, this is should I plan to spend a certain amount each year for senior services? Um, maybe if you had an average, like an annual or monthly average, break it down, or however you all in the audience would like to hear um, the cost of it, just shout it out. And it's going to be all over the place, and it's going to be like it depends kind of thing, right? Yes. Well, of course, it depends. Um, for our age, yeah, of course you should. You should plan for it. Really, at kind of at any age. But getting a 30-year-old to think, you know, when I'm 75, I'm gonna need some care, and the money I'm making now could be better spent saving for my future. It's really hard to find somebody that thinks that way. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of options, though, as we age, when we do have assets, to use assets to protect assets. So it really does depend, but there are solutions out there. There really are. I think when it comes to me for home care, um, the difference is your insurance plan. Um, the difference of traditional Medicare versus an Advantage plan, what Advantage plans say they cover, and then you end up in needing it and they don't cover. Um, so maybe that's someone we need to bring in as an independent insurance agent that can help with their Medicare or Advantage plans. Um, but that's that's a big thing of how much do I need because stuff that Medicare covers, others don't. And if you go with the others, you're gonna need that money. So that would be my big issue. I'm gonna pass it to the expert. <laughs> oh, well, Laura, did you have a question? I pound it every day. No, that's that's good. Uh, the long and short of it is read the fine print and always be looking at future care. Um, and it's it's going to be a hypothetical because we obviously don't know what's going to happen to our, our healthcare needs in the future. We can know by maybe uh, family history or our own history, that sort of thing. But I mean, we're, we're still just guessing, right? So yeah. Any other question? Oh, go ahead, Peter. Yes. That's, that's what I think. A, a very good point because I, I think also you get a lot of advertisement on TV. 
especially with uh, the Medicare supplements and so forth, and they really target seniors hard and make it even more confusing. That's why I think it's a good idea to work with professionals that can help you navigate through all the options. So there are a lot of options out there, and it, it's not one size fits, fits all. What may work with one person, not going to work with somebody else. So you want to work with uh, people that are know the landscape, that know your circumstances, that ask the right questions so you can find somebody that fits you and not just just a generic, you know, one, one size fits all kind of strategy. Yeah. So last month, I won't pick on you. Um, we had somebody, one of our audience members mentioned a commercial. Uh, after that event, I saw that commercial. I don't even watch TV. It just so happened I had uh, people visiting my house and they watched the news. So I had plugged in a cable antenna to have live TV on. And I saw the commercial that you mentioned um, that we talked about here. It was uh, about um, title fraud. Yeah, being able, people being able to steal your title. And we had, uh, our, our title company is not here, um, security title, but uh, she sort of answered that question. And we had the attorneys on the panel and they were like, same thing confirmed, it would be really hard. It would take a lot of fraudulent people in a row to uh, to actually be able to steal your title. And um, you all are targets. They're, they're playing these commercials during the day on television, probably also late at night, because I don't know how many senior clients we have that stay up real late at night and don't wake up until like 10 or 11 o'clock in, in the afternoon. Um, but so yeah, you guys are targets and they make it sound really scary, not just title fraud, but the same Medicare, Medicaid, um, planning, all of that stuff. And uh, the best thing to do is to, to not be afraid, understand the source um, and that they're, they're trying to pull you in and, and make you scared because that's when uh, you'll, you'll make the decisions that they want you to make out of fear. And, and so we don't want you making decisions out of fear. We want you to be making decisions uh, because you're educated and you know the right questions to ask because you've been here um, listening to our panelists and our sponsors. Um, you, you'll know the right questions to ask and who to talk to. So you won't be scammed. Good. Okay, so I do believe that we are now officially live on Facebook and YouTube, Downsizing Indie on Facebook and Indie Real Estate Experts on YouTube. So those of you who are really tech savvy, if you wanna um, hop over there and share the video on your social media pages. That would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then if you are online and you're watching, again, just type your questions into the comments and Sarah and I are watching and um, we'll, we'll ask them live here. All right, we don't have any questions on, on Zoom. Um, all right, so we'll move on. Does insurance cover any senior housing or services at home? You have the mic. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I mean, long term care, and there's different types of policies out there um, available. Uh, most of them will have some, some uh, funding for housing and, and so forth. Yeah. Again, with skilled home care, um, like when you need. The hospital, or you leave rehab, or you've fallen and you can't get up, <laughs> um, and you need some physical therapy, then insurance, uh, Medicare Part A, and it is covered under your Advantage plan as well, but sometimes not as long um, as traditional Medicare, but it is covered 100% in your home. Now, there are certain things, like let's say you have wound care that needs to be changed every day. Medicare will not pay us to come every day to change your wound. Um, we have to be able to teach someone how to do that so that we come maybe every three days, but you've got a neighbor, a spouse, a friend, a child that can do the days that we can't be there. Um, so there's, you know, there's intricates, but the majority of your nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, um, and a home health aid only to help give you a shower. Um, is covered under skilled, um, skilled care, Medicare Part A. As far as insurance, uh, long-term care insurance has had a bad rap 
for quite a while. Yes. Some of the old traditional plans, if anybody ever tried to pitch one to you, was you would pay something for life. And uh, you would, if you passed away, you didn't get any benefit. That's kind of terrible. That's not unlike auto insurance. If you never have an accident, you've paid it. But I want my auto insurance. I want my homeowner's yeah. insurance. About 30 years ago or so, there was hybrid long-term care insurance. But that is not so. It's not use it or lose it. If you pass, there is a death benefit that goes to beneficiaries. Uh, some company, a lot of companies have gotten out of it. Genworth was a big one. Mm -hmm. But what would happen is you would retire and you were paying X. Well, then in retirement, maybe five years in, your premiums went up. And then 10 years in, they went up more. And a lot of seniors were having to cancel their policies because they couldn't afford it. That is not used really in financial planning. Those policies are no good. Um, Mutual of Omaha has some good policies. There are some life insurance policies that have long-term care riders. You gotta be careful on those. It might only caught, um, kick in for facilities. Yeah. Um, what, tell them what that means. What does, we, we say community, we don't like the F word, the facilities, but uh, I know what you're talking about, but our audience does not. Assisted living, uh, anything uh, in a uh, long-term care facility. A home health aid. Home health. A home health aid in the home. Like it has a kicker. So let's say their kicker is you had to be in the hospital 10 days and you're going home. So then it'll kick in to maybe um, give you a home health aid a couple hours a day, but no two policies are alike. And, you know, our company, we just ask you, if you have a copy of your policy, let us see it because um, our administrator is a series seven and he can look at it and he knows exactly. A lot of times also, if it gives you certain things, you have to pay it up front and then you have to send in the receipt to the long-term care provider. So that's, you know, that, that's a big difference. Um, I can work with any company. Probably the best company is right here in Indianapolis. It's One America. They were the leaders in um, asset care, protecting your assets. And what their policies do is you either pay monthly, annually, or you give uh, a one-time payment. That payment gives you an amount of money every month for your care. Obviously you get more when you're younger, but it goes through age 85 or 86, I believe. Those funds that then you get, you get the benefit monthly can be used basically for anything. If you need to, the idea is to stay in your home. It is income. So this insurance is income when you need it most. So you can stay at home. Social Security, if you have a pension, plus now you get a monthly benefit from an insurance company that allows you to be where you want to be. So the answer is yes, it can pay for things in home because that's the goal. One here in America. Big building down there. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Are we I have a question. Okay, Sarah has a question. I know you didn't say that again. So if I wanted to go to a assisted living, will my Medicare cover that? If she wanted to go to assisted living, will her Medicare cover that? No. No. <laughs> and everybody thinks that it will. Yeah. Did everyone hear that? No, and everyone thinks that will. Okay, elaborate, <laughs> please. <laughs> There's not much elaboration. Medicare does <laughs> not cover that. <laughs> if we wanted to have coverage, what would we need? Lots of assets <laughs> to pay dollar for dollar, which is not how we made money. Having a long-term care policy, uh, having the right life insurance. Like I said, there are solutions that people just were never educated about. So talking to Fido, Fido myself will 
get you some answers. If I'm in my 70s or even my 80s already, is it too late for long-term care insurance or life, life insurance? No, um, there, there is underwriting and you might think, oh, I can't pass that. There is uh, life insurance uh, based long-term care. There is also something called annuity care that doesn't have the underwriting for that. If you have some qualified money, uh, you know, that the IRS hasn't gotten, or uh, Uncle Sam, our favorite uncle, hasn't hey, gotten their portion, you can fund long-term care with uh, an IRA, a 401k. There are lots of funding options. Some of them require some form of underwriting, and then some require much less. But it's talking with a specialist that will help you. And that could be either you or Vito? Yes. All right. Question in the audience. Underwriting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Underwriting means? Um, uh, there's an underwriting for getting your loan for your home. Underwriters look, what do you mean you have no income? Um, and you want us to give you a mortgage. Yeah. It doesn't pass. Or they go, oh, you, know, you only make this much. We're not going to underwrite you for 300,000, but we'll do 250. Insurance companies, the nice thing about insurance is the risk is on somebody else. That's what life insurance is. That's what long-term care is. You're giving some money for a benefit later. So if we were a life insurance company, and you knew I was diabetic and just was diagnosed a month ago, I'm like, you know, I'm not sure that I'm going to approve this person for life insurance. Might have to wait two years to see what, how under control he is. But we'll look at him again in two years. Or somebody who's 22 years old, great health, they go through underwriting, there are no issues. Yep, you get what you've applied for. Did that answer your question? Good. Do you have one back there, ma'am? Oh, oh, okay. So Same I question. have a question. What about what you see on TV that, that I know, <laughs> but I just want to bring it up. Was that audible? That was an audible yeah. sign. Because you see on TV, um, oh, I got this life insurance for $10 a month and it doesn't matter your age or whatever. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm like, I don't get that. Um, what did Mama say? If it sounds too good to be true, it is. It is. It is. It is. Now, yeah. I'm not a uh, uh, advertising specialist. I think what they say on TV has to be true. You can get, you know, uh, for the, the, they say a hundred dollars a month. But you want two hundred thousand dollars? Do you think you're getting that? Hundred dollars a month. They might give you a policy for a thousand dollar death benefit. So I, I think they have to be honest, but you're not getting a million dollars at my age. No, uh, no doctor, no underwriting. We'll just give it to you. If we were the insurance company, we would not take that risk. So don't believe that. Good question. Yeah. Is a thing called actuary science, which mm, poke my eyeball out with the pencil. But they figure all of these things out. Uh, so the odds are in the favor of the, the business. I mean, you have to think they wouldn't be in business if they were making bad business choices. And it would be a bad business choice for them to, to, to play the odds in your favor and not theirs. I mean, you know. And let, let me explain yeah. actuarial science. That's what actuaries do. I'm 62. Um, Mutual of Omaha knows how many 62 year olds are going to die this year pretty close to the exact number they just can't say that it's tim garrity they don't know if it's me but the science shows this number of 62 year olds 70 75 25 year olds will pass it's a science mm -hmm. we just don't know who it will be also they they have uh Insurance, insurance companies have rates, uh, and they, they are gauged by their financials uh, and so forth. Um, you definitely want to look at what the ratings are, uh, because it doesn't matter if you're paying, if you get a great, great deal, 
the car insurance company goes belly up or cannot pay their, their claims, then it, it was pretty worthless. So uh, the foundational piece of life insurance companies is making sure that their, their, their fundamentals are strong and their ratings are you know, on, on the top tier. Is there somewhere we can go to look at an insurance company's ratings? Yes, yeah, their website. Is, this, uh, is it Limra? Limra. Limra. Um, their website, it has to say that they are AM best rated. There are a few rating companies. Yeah, and every insurance company, when you go into their website, they will put in there what their rating is. So you have to see. They have, what, to. Yeah, okay, they right. have to put their rating on their website. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Um, it, I'm going to check online. Any questions online? Any questions in the in person audience? These are, these are, so, I mean, I learn something every single time we have this panel. Um, so these are such good topics. Uh, and even though we repeat them, I encourage you guys to come back uh, next year if you see something that sounds the same, because we always learn something different at them. The one uh, last month that we had with the attorneys and the funeral planner, um, there's just, I mean, where do you get 90 minutes of two attorneys, not one, two attorneys time for, for free? nowhere but here <laughs> so another shameless plug all right uh okay so let's see here did we talk about insurance right does any um okay who should i talk to about my financial and long-term health care needs well you know well, well, uh, uh, and and it's it's uh we got it down pretty much to a science i mean we we know what the cost of things are, we have a, a fairly good idea, inflationary wise, uh, projected over you know decades. So we were able to take individual circumstances of, of a couple or, or, or individual and kind of forecast what their circumstances are based on the reality of what's, what's going on and give you a pretty good idea of, of what needs to happen uh, right here to get from point A to point B. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the primary reason why you would use professionals is that they can walk you through where you're at currently, where you like to be, take your circumstances into consideration and come up with a game plan to get you to where you want to go. Uh, and that's primarily what we do. So, um, did you want to add to that? Sure. Okay. Financial advising, there's really kind of two parts to it. If you think about it, um, and I love Vito's company, Sherpa. If you're climbing Mount Everest, you want to hire a guide, a Sherpa, right? Yeah. Well, in the financial world, there are people that specialize in building your assets. That's climbing up the mountain, accumulation. We're all, we want to accumulate money to get to the point where we can be at the top of the mountain and say, I'm done. I want to retire, I want to stop working, I want to do the work I want to do. Now you have a bag of money and now you've got to go down the mountain. And how long do you want that money to last? Probably for the rest of your life. But here's a tricky question. How long are we gonna live? That's an unknown. How is the market going to do in our retirement? We know what it's doing right now, and that's impacting us. So you really kind of have to know who you're talking to. There are people that are great at accumulating money. There are great people helping distribution. Some do it together, some do it separately. Because that's a strategy too, how you are gonna distribute your money um, and when you do retire or slow down and do the things that you actually want to do. Um, and talk more about that. Why, for, for what? Well, the, Why is that a strategy? Well, um, most er everybody does not have any idea what the distribution rate is in taking out your money. Does anybody, what do you, I'm not gonna ask you though. <laughs> what, what's the distribution rate? Can you take out 10% a year? 20%, 5%? about 3% of your money. Because we don't know what the market's gonna do, we don't know how long we're gonna live. Would you agree? So that's yeah. the safe bet, about That's 3%. the safe bet. Okay. It but, used to be five, then it was more, now they're saying you know, roughly about 3%. Yeah. So if you've got a million dollars, you can safely take out $30,000 a year in retirement income. Mm. Well, I need more than that. 
So you have to have a plan to be able to take out more. And that involves accumulation specialists, distribution specialists. So the answer to the question, who should I talk to about my financial long-term health care? Financial professionals, not one, you can have five. You're the CEO of your company. That's a really good point. Hire as many, you can hire, you know, and myself. And you don't have to hire, you can get consulting. But get opinions, see what people say. You get educated, you will make the right decision once you have information. And do I have to have a million dollars in assets or more to talk to either one of you? No. No way. No. no. Uh, at least for me, I mean, like I said, I was an engineer for 14 years. My main reason to change careers is one, I wanted to have an impact with individuals. Um, I, I, I got bored with engineering, with, with financial planning. Every circumstance is different. Uh, especially when you get to, to people who are seniors, uh, sometimes they want to bring their children into the equations, other families are private and they don't want their children to know. So there's a lot to navigate through there. When do you, when do I take social security? You know, how much am I going to get? How much money my wife's going to get? Uh, what happens to my assets after I pass? What happens to my assets if I'm incapacitated? So uh, to me, it's like a puzzle that you put it together and asking all the questions and be able to go through each individual circumstance. To me, that's what uh, that's what I appreciate about my job, and uh, I, I I talk to everybody because you, you never know the impact you can have with people. And there's there's one thing you do for a job. There's another thing where you really want to help just people in general to get to where they want to go. And sometimes people you just don't have money, and you say, okay, if somebody that doesn't have any money, do they need a financial advisor? I would say yes. Uh, they probably need it more if you have a a single divorced woman with three kids that making very little money and no assets, do they need to talk to a financial advisor? Yes, because they, yes, the financial advisor may not make any money, but again, if you're getting into this just to make money, my hunch is you won't last, you know, 20, 25 years, because uh, people figure that out. Uh, so to me, that's, at least that's my passion. That's why I got into this business. That's all really good points. We have a question in the back. Yes. I'm sorry. How, this is uh, one of the questions I was going to ask, so thank you. How do you guys get paid? There's different ways. Yeah, absolutely. There's different. Uh, that's an excellent question. We get that question just about every time. Um, so there's yeah, there's financial advisors that get paid commissions. So they they will offer you or suggest a product, whether it be a long term care product or a annuity product or a mutual fund, and their compensation comes from the commission that's being paid by that product. Uh, I don't work that way. Uh, the other way that you get paid is um, a, a fee based on assets under management, uh, where let's say that you manage, you know, a million dollars or let's say a hundred thousand dollars for somebody. Uh, percentage uh, usually is one percent uh, of assets that you're managing. That's what uh, you get your compensation for. Uh, if you do financial planning, some advisors will charge for the financial plan itself. Uh, in, independent of the assets. So if somebody comes in, they just want a financial plan. They don't want to invest assets. Uh, then some advisors will will charge a per hour fee, and it varies for each advisor. For myself, uh, I don't charge for financial plans because I think everybody needs one. And if you start charging, uh, you know, it's going to limit the number of people that are actually going to get that benefit. Uh, so to me, uh, I sit down with people. I, I would give at least an hour of my time, see what they can do different, give them some recommendations, give them some homework usually of things they can be doing, and maybe later on we can uh, do more. But that's at least how I operate. I don't know, Tim, uh, on your end. That was an excellent uh, explanation of how it's done. I do not charge for my services. Um, if somebody needs something, they get multiple recommendations. If they go with, with whatever they want, that company pays a commission to me. Doesn't come out of your money, your assets. Um, I do not manage people's assets. I don't want that um, pressure. Stress. Especially, <laughs> especially in today's environment. I advise, I, I ask clients to go see somebody else that can help them better. I'm an advisor educator on financial matters. And, uh, oh, yes, go ahead, Phil. Companies like Northwestern and MetLife have planners that you're looking at. They also have 
So the question was, do companies that help get you up the mountain with those financial plans um, also have people, specialists who help you get down the mountain as Tim was using as a... They may, they may not. So now everybody is armed with a little more uh, knowledge. Hey, I've, I've gotten up the mountain. How am I getting down? Do you do that? Do I go to somebody else? Yeah, these, this is why I love these events, because we just don't know what we don't know. And if you've never heard this before, you know, they don't teach financial planning in high school or college unless that's what you go to college for. And so when you get here, unless somebody has taken the time to uh, give you an entire, you know, um, class on financial planning, you don't know what you don't know. And so you don't know what questions to even ask. And now, at least, if you didn't know you know, there, there are specialists who um, help with um, distributing your assets when you're at the end, you know, retiring or slowing down those sorts of things. Now, you know, now you can go to somebody and ask, um, is there somebody who specializes in distribution of my assets when that time comes in a strategic way, yeah. right? Well, you would say that, Lisa. Um, so one of my, biggest thing is with, with high schoolers, uh, and you're right, uh, schools really in the past have not done a very good job of educating for generations. Um, you know, we're supposed to just know how to handle money. Um, I've gone to uh, several schools and I've done talks with, with kids, and I can tell you that they're sponges. Uh, they want to know about this stuff, uh, and I think it's, it's part of our job to educate them. So. Uh, if you have grandkids, uh, even your own kids, uh, I would encourage you for them to go to their school and ask for financial education if, if it's not being offered, uh, because I think it's important to start the foundation early. Um, and as far as to, to address your question, yes, I mean, every company will tell you that they will do all of it. Uh, accumulation, distribution, and everything. So I would, I would, I would ask questions, uh, very, you know, how many, seniors uh, you guys have uh, managed assets for mm -hmm. uh, what are your credentials or qualifications to for it because the, the distribution phase is different than the accumulation phase somebody that's 20 that's 20 or 30 years old has different needs um, than somebody that's 60 70 and and it's hard to stay on top of the entire life cycle when it comes to investment so uh, you want to talk to somebody that, that specializes or at least has a well-rounded knowledge of the distribution phase uh, and yeah um, surf financial planners typically have higher levels of education in in those areas Certified so the, the CFP. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that would be a good start doesn't mean that they're great compared to somebody that doesn't have it but at least they have a higher standard uh, as far as requirements and uh, their fiduciary standards are there for them uh, so that would be a good starting point uh, cfp.org uh, you can go in there and get uh, educated on, uh, you know, all the aspects of financial planning and how to pick somebody that, that fits your particular needs. And it's the CFP, the Certified Financial Planner, that is a fiduciary for their clients, yes? And is there any other type of financial planner that has that fiduciary responsibility? Well, we're, we're, we're shifting that way as an industry. Yeah. Uh, the government is actually pushing hard and uh, having a fiduciary standard uh, going across the board. So we're heading that way. I don't think we're all the way there, but that's that's the trend. With CFPs, they are required. You cannot be a CFP, hold a CFP designation without having a fiduciary standard. Uh, and for those of you who maybe have heard the word, but I'm not sure what that means. Fiduciary standard means that when I sit in front of a client, uh, I cannot be thinking about what is in my best interest. I have to be thinking of what is in the best interest of the person sitting in front of you. That's what makes the fiduciary standard work. If you do something that appears to benefit you uh, or your primary goal and motivation is yourself instead of the, uh, the client, you lose your, you lose your CFP designation uh, license. Uh, so uh, that, that's why it's so important. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be where as long as you, and there's fiduciary standard, there's suitability standard. The suitability standard tells you basically, as long as I recommend something that's suitable to you, if I have three products 
and all three products are suitable to you. And I recommended those because I'm going to make a little bit more money. Suitability standard that is met. You would not meet the fiduciary standard. That's what the fiduciary standard is a higher standard because I have to do what's in the best interest of the client, not myself or my company. And if I get caught with that not being the case, you're out. You, you lose your license. So. Yeah. It's the same for real estate brokers who are members of the Board of Realtors. Um, we call ourselves realtors, or that, that's our industry. Um, uh, what do you call it? Board. Um, and if we act out, we, we have a code of ethics that we have to um, adhere to or we could lose our membership to our board of realtors. And one of them is fiduciary responsibility, which means that we we act in our client's best interest, not the best interest of ourselves. So um, I, uh, I think that's a, another good question to ask when you're interviewing um, uh, potential you know, financial planners about their fiduciary for their clients. Um, I had a question, maybe all of you could answer this. You mentioned, Fido, um, sometimes people get really private when it comes to sharing things with their children. And uh, why, do you, why do you think that is? I mean, it could be healthcare, it could be financial, it could be, you know. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, it's a tricky, dicey situation that varies from family to family. A, a lot of it has to do with their values, their upbringing, uh, sometimes uh, people is people's perception about money. Uh, some people are private about their money. Uh, you know, for myself, I've always been really open with my kids. I, I want I want them to know, uh, but that's not the case with a lot of people. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just some people like to stay private, and some people uh, worry about conflict, um, friction between their children. Mm -hmm. uh, if if they think one child can handle money better than the other, and they may leave that kid as the personal responsible. If they get sick, then that creates friction. So that's where the privacy yeah. comes into it. And that, that's why as, as financial planners, at least on our end, is that we need to know the client situation. We need to have our, our finger on the pulse to say, okay, we can bring the kids in, but we're not gonna discuss everything. We're just gonna discuss yeah. these boundaries. It's so it doesn't have to be black and white or nothing. We can pick and choose which areas are useful and beneficial for the client and not for everybody else. Yeah, what about you two in terms of their care? Family dynamics is such a fun. <laughs> <laughs> She's being sarcastic. Oh, it's it's, it's that. such a fun way to deal with. Um, <laughs> I mean, and that's, you know, because I was that caregiver, I can relate and tell siblings calm down, back off. It's still your mom and dad. They're still in charge or make them believe they are still in charge. Because sometimes if you've got dementia, but mom still believes she can make decisions, it's in how you help the kids um, deal with how their parents' reaction. The other thing I always say to everyone is make sure you have a power of attorney, durable power of attorney, make sure you have a living will, and make sure someone else's name is on your checking account. When my dad died, we, and my dad sold insurance his whole life, which was crazy. You should think he would know. Um, but my mom wasn't on my dad's checking account. You know, we had no clue. So that's why I preach get, get those, you know, big three things. And people do like to be quiet, they don't want their children to know that they need help. So it, it's all in how we speak to them. What about you, Jill? The family dynamics? They're very fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't even think it has to be kids. I think it, I mean, so. Um, it could be husband and wife. Yeah. Or yeah, caretaker and caretaker. Yeah. It or, is. So there's just, there's a lot of dynamics there. Um, I won't point fingers or anything, but there was someone that I accidentally asked how their family member was, and they had passed away. Um, and I, I apologize, but um, she was just explaining to me, well, yes, that situation had resolved itself, but now we're dealing with the estate and he had no one named um, on the estate or was able to help or even knew where the money was. So stuff like that um, comes up all the time with us. Um, so even with our care, it could be five kids and every, every kid has a different opinion of what mom or dad needs. Um, and so if, as long as you have it, where you have said what you want um, and, and the will and all of that stuff, then it would be much easier for everyone, including yourself. 
And you don't want to see your kids at the end of life arguing and fighting over money, care, anything like that. Um, not at that point. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you guys say is that you can, there is a way to be protect your privacy and maybe not start a rift between family members um, and also still uh, protect uh, your dignity and privacy to a certain extent. And that is through uh, power of attorney, wills, um, naming someone else on checking accounts and maybe even um, we have our attorney here. Um, our attorneys, I forget because Jeff's not here, you have to tell him. Um, uh, or, or also naming a, a trustee or somebody to be over that that estate or will. Yeah? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, what's the power of attorney uh, hold or be okay in your checking account? If it's a durable, power of attorney, medical, and financial. Okay. But when you pass away, that document goes away. So that's why you need to have another name on your account so that if you pass, everything isn't frozen. Oh, so yeah, so the question for the online audience here, uh, by the way, this is our online audience for you guys, just act like this is an audience member if you haven't gathered that, um, is uh, she asked about power of attorney, uh, durable power of attorney, and uh, I'll let Miranda and then Stinson uh, handle that. So it's, uh, I, I don't like to see somebody listed as a joint owner on your checking account unless somebody has a shared account you both have contributed to. I, I would rather see that person added as a power of attorney because then they have that fiduciary duty to you. Yes, that power of attorney will cease to have access when you pass away, but you can. Uh, go to your bank and designate a payable on death beneficiary or more. You could have to be spouse, kids, whoever, uh, as well. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to, that, to do that. So talking to your estate planning attorney, they can help you figure out whether you should have a state POD, whether maybe you need a trust. Um, but yes, having your power of attorney on your account as a power of attorney. So you submit the um, power of attorney paperwork to the bank. The power attorney goes with you, they have to sign up for the account, and then they have access, but they also uh, are answerable to you, so you can always ask them, what did you uh, take all that money for, um, if you have questions on that. What if you're sick and you are not able to ask that power attorney, like, what are you doing with my money? So there are other people who, by statute, have the authority to ask that power attorney for an accounting. Um, and so there is protection even if you are incapacitated. So that's really a probably a broader discussion that we have to yeah. today. <laughs> I'm not a speaker today, uh, but yes, there are ways to have, share your account with other people so they have access that can protect you and ensure that someone has access after you pass away without them having to go through that probate process. Talking to your attorney uh, is is the first step I think typically on that direction. Did you want to add anything? Miranda said it wonderfully. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that was awesome. And I am not an attorney, so I will not give any legal advice. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, ma'am. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. Um, going with, with what Miranda said, maybe what I have been explained to me is that if I put a child on my checking account, and she's in a major traffic accident, they can come for my money as well. Okay, you know, so that she's sued. She's on my checking account. My money is her money. Okay, so the question was, um, if she, if, if you just put a person like a child on your checking account, not as a power attorney, like Marina was explaining, that if uh, she's in a major accident or something financial, now my money is her money. Is that right, Miranda, from what your experience? <laughs> Sorry, you didn't know you were going to, I told Dave okay. you might get asked some questions. That is uh, potentially correct. And so you don't want to be in that situation. You may be able to protect yourself if you can show that all of the income, all of the money that came into there really was yours, but how, and that may or may not be true. It's going to be kind of, a, you know, in some cases, it's that fact specific. How much accounting are you going to have to show years, months, to show that that's really your money and not their money? Um, and so it's best to protect yourself to uh, have the longer at that power of I, I even had to correct my own data. So oh. people just don't know this. 
All right, any other questions on that? I think our mic is running out of batteries. Um, okay, is that, okay, so the last piece of advice, your best advice that you can leave everybody with. Uh, for me, I would say, uh, make sure that your wishes, your um, all your contacts, everything is somewhere. Um, you never know what can happen in life. And, and uh, one thing I've seen with families is when somebody passes away, when they're incapacitated, um, uh, not only they're going through obviously the grieving process and the stress of dealing with uh, healthcare issues, uh, but then having to figure out, sort out, you know, where's all the contacts, where are the doctors, where, who are the beneficiaries, uh, what policies, life insurance policies, long-term care policies, investment statements, IRS, 401ks, where is all that information where family members have to go into somebody, their, their mom's or dad's house and try to sort it all out. Um, long time ago, I put together a, a, a kind of a booklet uh, that helped you kind of trigger uh, the right questions to us. And that's what it is, it's called Family Transitions. And it's a document that I have for myself and I have it in a, in a, in a, a file cabinet where I tell my kids, if something happens to me, this is where all the information, so here's where all my doctors are, these are all my accounts, account numbers. You don't even have to put uh, specifics about dollar amount, but just enough information for your kids or whoever is gonna be managing your estate or, or your, your situation has a place to go to get that information. So I urge you guys to do that because I've walked into too many situations where uh, because of privacy, the kids or the care, uh, caregivers do not have any information. And then we're sitting there trying to put together clues as to where everything is at. So just urge you to do that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to add something to that. Um, in my years of working in healthcare, um, I remember sitting with a family when I was working with Brightstar. And the father was talking about all of these documents, right? I have all this stuff, it's all laid out. My son knows that he's, you know, has access to all this different stuff, my will's in there, like all this information. It's in this in the safety deposit box. And the son turned and said, That's great, Dad, but you've hidden the key, and I have no idea how to get in that box to access any no of that information. Yes, yeah. fine. So Make sure, just if you have the documents, great, but make sure somebody knows where it is and how to get to it, how to access it. So question. make sure you know where it is. <laughs> yes, go ahead. How does somebody get into the safety box? Oh, yeah. How does somebody get into the safety deposit box? You typically, with most banks, you can designate before you pass away on their forms that somebody has access after you pass away. Typically, your personal representative uh, through your will, whoever is handling your estate, will have access once they open the estate. Now, that could take a while uh, to get to that point. And so, if you want someone to have access right away, which I think you should, you need to make sure you fill out the form with your bank. But specifically doesn't mean that somebody has access. Ideally, while you're still alive, if you are keeping your power attorney uh, and other documents that they may need while you're still alive, uh, and that somebody has access to the cat. So, so like, you think you will be the same box. Yeah, so that's a problem because we're gonna have to get your will. Uh, somebody's gonna have to have the original plus open the probate estate. So you're gonna have to make sure that somebody that you trust has access that meaning not just that they have a key but you've gone to the bank and told the bank and filled out the form that says they have access to the key i don't know specifically what they have call just go it. to the bank and ask what form do i need to fill out to give somebody access to my safety deposit box you can show up with the key and the bank's probably not going to let you in unless you can show that you also have um, illegal access to it which makes sense yeah, which is frustrating, but they're just doing their job. Right, so, right. Yeah. And a lot of people these days don't have safety deposit boxes. Right. In this newer generation, they don't. Yes, me and Lauren. So I'd like to point back to my perspective from working in an environment being doing some kind of capacity. We have people who have come in to suffer the stroke or who are in the process of being incapacitated, like Adam and his brother. 
Yeah, and I think the recommended time was every year, right, annually? Uh, update, update those documents with your old, elder law attorney every year. Or just, yeah, just look at it. And if you need any updates, then you would reach out. Okay. So, any questions from the, any more from the in person audience, or what about online? See any? This was a lot of juicy information. I saw many of you taking notes. Um, I did finally get it to record. So um, we'll put this on our website if you wanna review it again. Uh, if you missed a word um, that somebody said, uh, you can get to it that way. Yes, sir? You have asked. I sure do. That's a great question. We started recording in 2021 um, because I think we were, we were Zoom. In, in, I don't know, in 2020 at some point. And then in 2021, we started recording. They're not like professional, the best quality, as you can see, I'm your videographer <laughs> and your host. And that's not what I do for a living. <laughs> uh, so, but um, most of them you should be able to hear. And if you have a question, if there's something that is on the video and you can't get it, just reach out to us because we've got, the contacts for all of our panelists, all of our sponsors year after year, um, and, and all the content. So in 2021, and then all of this year, they're, they're online. So, and then after this one, I'll update um, that the website with the new, um, this new video. So, yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. Wait, yeah. I just want to encourage everybody to ask questions. I know that seems simple. Um, and I know that it's, it, it's just, that's the number one thing. Yeah. You can never ask enough questions. If somebody is confident in their business um, and they know what they're doing, they will not mind you getting a second opinion. That they shouldn't Absolutely. mind at all because it should be, you know, you should be getting advice from several different people to compile and, and educate yourself. So yeah. I have a lot of families that come to me who have never had to have home care before. Stuff happens suddenly. Um, their spouse has a stroke, you know, so, I mean, it's just, that happens suddenly and all of a sudden they're clueless as to what to do, but when they call me, I'm more than happy to give them names of other companies to call, compare rates, compare, yeah. um, you know, he asked a great question about how do we, um, you know, credential our caregivers and, and what do we do for background checks? You want to make sure that some of them are certified. Um, so just ask questions. Um, Wait, did we finish our best piece of advice? I'm sorry, it just occurred to me. Is this your oh, best piece of advice? There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. No, but please keep asking questions. Do it, ask it over and over and over again. It, 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 this is so hard. It is yeah. one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do. I was going to say also contact any of these panelists or sponsors for a list of questions because, again, I keep going back to we don't know what we don't know. If you've never done this before, you don't know what questions to ask. And even if you have done it before, but it was a long time ago, you may not know what questions to ask, right? So I didn't know the checking account. Yeah. I have no idea. So that's amazing. Your best piece of advice? Um, my best piece of advice is trust your gut. I mean, we've done it our whole lives. And if you're talking to Sally and it just doesn't feel right, and you talk to Jim and it does, then go with Jim because, you know, you're smart people. And the other thing, I've given you my business card. And if you ever need a resource, please don't hesitate to call me. Don't wait till you're in the hospital and you're getting discharged to call me. If you need a if you need a resource, please call me and I will be glad and honored to help you out. Nothing to add because it's all been said. Uh, of of uh, best advice, I would just leave you with. I left you with uh, a piece from One America on asset care. There, you can take a look at that if that is something you ever want to talk about. So they can talk to me about that. For the online audience, I'll get a copy of this and upload it into our Google Drive. Oh, well, Sarah, never mind. Sarah already did it. So thank you. Um, and I, you, I cannot tell you how wonderful uh, these 
the panelists are and the sponsors that we we partner with um, every year I just I get more and more impressed and um, just honored to be able to be in the same space um, you know as as, as these, these people um, they're knowledgeable they care about seniors they care about educating people um, and you're not going to go wrong uh, with with the people that we have the group of people in this room um, that we have each month. So I really appreciate you guys. Can we give our panelists a round of applause? And again, thank you to the sponsor. Couldn't do this without you. There's obviously a cost to it. Um, please go visit them. I feel um, just as, as privileged to be partnering with them. Uh, we had a great senior tour, um, both at Discovery Commons and Westminster Village. Not a lot of people are showing up to these, but it's really a great opportunity to go and tour um, and get some one-on-one -on -one, uh, without feeling like you're just there with the salesperson, you have to make a decision today. So, and also when you're in a group of people, other people might ask questions that you didn't think about asking. So, um, yeah, so we'll be putting out some other um, senior tours with our, our senior community partners. Um, we just have to get them to get it on the books, right? Um, so, all right, so Diana is gonna pull some names out of the basket. We're gonna go up, give away some prizes. Okay, oh, yes, do it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Stacy's basket. Stacy Bonas with clear captions always brings the basket in before the event. Many of you guys don't get to see her, but she's She's really awesome. She knows her stuff and she gives away free phones um, that help you talk to people even when you can't. And that was Jen and Betty. Jen and Betty. Yes, you won the basket. <laughs> you can take it to Betty and be like, I was I was thinking about you. I got you this. Yeah. And you'll get some cool points. Yeah. Also, if you're in person, there's a feedback form and I'd love it if you can fill that out. And online, um, Sarah will. Uh, post the link online so you can fill out the feedback form and um, we'll take a look at that and take your feedback. We're starting to think about um, events for topics for next year and um, we've got some exciting things coming for 2023 which I cannot believe it's already 2023 coming up. So Next, Nancy Hexamer. Yeah, you won. So you can take the flowers right in front of you and we'll give away a few more flowers. Do we have any, do you guys have any uh, door prizes? You don't have to, it's not a requirement. Okay. Uh, Phil Hexamer. Well, oh, Phil. Phil. <laughs> oh, you got, you got your wife a rose. How nice of you. Yeah. <laughs> You could actually take it to your neighbor who we met at Westminster Village, I think, right? Did we meet your neighbor at Westminster? Oh, I'm getting it mixed up with, um, never. oh, you did. Okay, yeah, all right, perfect. Cynthia Blazingham? Oh, yes, right here. Take a row. All right, we'll do, we'll do one, one more. Maybe we need to do two more so Sarah can do. Oh, yeah, okay. Phil Boer. We got a duo again. <laughs> Mary Keen. Oh, that's, that's yeah. Yeah. She just wanted. There's one right there. Oh, we'll give you another one. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, Tiffany's mother is here. I'm so sorry. Tell me your name again. Brenda. Oh, I should remember that. Brenda and uh, Tiffany are the owners of Eagle Del Flores. They're the ones that bring these beautiful flowers every single month for like seven years now. And they last um, a good three or four weeks. I don't know what you guys do to the flowers, but we well, love we them. Do. I use Eagle Del all the time. Yeah, Eagle Del Florist. Yes, and they're also a sponsor, an in-kind sponsor. So, um, okay, so Sarah, do you know what next month? I think it's... Uh, we'll, we'll be in July. I was going to tell you what next month's topic was. I was so trying to get online with everything that I didn't even look at what next month. Oh, we do? Okay, well, while she's doing that, um, we're going to take one more. Carl Zepp. All right. It's good to put a face with the name. Yeah, that's for all your great questions that you asked, right? Um, oh yeah, the scam one, you're a fraud. This will be a really good one. It's always a good one. We have an amazing uh, set of panelists. And then uh, we have another one coming up about taking trips. Um, 
fun and, and inexpensive trips, and I'm excited about that too. So you can go online and RSVP, downsizingindy.com, or you can always call that voicemail number, the 317-731-2289, and just leave me a voicemail and we'll add you to the RSVP list. And uh, without further ado, thank you to you all for driving here or tuning in on Zoom. Uh, thank you, Zoomers. Can you see me? I'm trying to wave at the game. <laughs> uh, yeah, have a great weekend, guys. Enjoy the weather. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. It was really good to see you. <laughs>